Scott Rideshell. Welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Aaron, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Hey guys, on the line, I've got Dave DeCamp, news editor at antiwar.com. That's news.antiwar.com. I swear he writes 10 articles a day or some crazy thing and he knows everything in the world, which is why we, including me, are so lucky to have him here today. Welcome back. How you doing, Dave? I'm good, Scott. Thanks for having me. So what is the god dang deal, Bobby? Go ahead. Yeah, so today, Friday, August 20th, uh, I just watched Biden just gave us a little update on the Afghanistan evacuation. Um, So right now there's currently about, he said there's almost 6,000 U.S. troops at the Kabul airport. uh, And that's roughly what the Pentagon has authorized for the deployment. So uh, I don't think they're going to be sending any more troops at this point. They're evacuating, airlifting American citizens and Afghan allies. And then there's the European, uh, you know, NATO people and stuff that are also being evacuated. Um, Biden said, so as of Friday, since they started these airlifts on Saturday, they've evacuated 13,000 people, um, which means that they're doing it at a pretty good rate now. So over the past 24 hours, they evacuated 5,700 people. And this is just the U.S. doing it. There's also civilian charters and stuff. Um, Before that, the rate was like 2,000 people a day. So it seems like they've stepped up the rate. And one thing they're not sure of is how many U.S. citizens are left in Afghanistan. Some people said between five and 10,000. Others said between 10 and 15,000. But yeah, so that's what the U.S. is what Biden is focusing on now, you know, that there's more troops in Afghanistan right now than there have been in a few years, uh, maybe not a few years, but in, in a while. And the U S has a ton of air power at the airport. There's F 18s and B 52s doing flyovers of Kabul. And, uh, so, you know, things are tense. Um, but right now it Biden, you know, He took questions today. I know one of his press conferences, he didn't take any. Well, I guess it wasn't a press conference. When he gave a speech Monday on Afghanistan, he didn't take any questions. And all these reporters kind of screaming at him, are are you going to send troops into Kabul to extract U.S. citizens? And uh, he said no. Um, Lloyd Austin, Secretary of Defense, took similar questions the other day. He said no, they don't have the capability. But they're all saying that the Taliban is letting them. If you're an American with a passport, they're you know, you're getting through the Taliban checkpoints. Biden said they're in constant communication with the Taliban. Um, now, Afghan, there's been reports of some Afghans uh, that have had issues. But for the Americans right now, it seems like they, they haven't had a problem getting to the airport. Now, uh, at the airport, there's big crowds, crowds and it's, it's hectic and things are pretty crazy on the ground there. But uh, he said that the military had to get Uh, They got 160 U.S. citizens over one of the walls of the airport because they were stuck in a crowd or something. So, I mean, things are hectic, but uh, he seems pretty determined to get everybody out and get out of there. Um, And the Taliban has every interest to to let this evacuation happen. Um, So hopefully, you know, this wraps up. He said his, his withdrawal deadline now is August 31st, and he said that they would stay longer if need be. But I, I, I really I don't think that uh, he's going to do any kind of escalation. I, I think they're going to finish this evacuation and that's going to be that. Um, yeah. Yeah, but, you know, it's it's interesting to see all the reporters just yelling at, you know, why? Why do you trust the Taliban? It's like the whole media has turned on Biden for the withdrawal. And, you know, our criticism of him is, is that he uh, broke the deal, the U.S. Taliban deal that was signed in Doha last year by extending the original May 1st withdrawal deadline. I think that's the only way that this could have gone a little better is if he stuck to it, yep. which would have meant as soon as he came to office, he, he would have started the withdrawal pretty much. But even then, I mean, considering how quickly everything folded and collapsed, it wouldn't have been much better than this. Um, so, I mean, all things considered, they got the embassy evacuated pretty quickly. They had like a whole infantry battalion with them the whole time. Um, 
and Americans aren't dying. And, you know, there's reports of the Taliban going around door to door, but they're just kind of reports unconfirmed. Uh, you know, the Taliban aren't great, but it kind of seems like the way things are on the ground it is a general calm and things could be a, a hell of a lot worse. Yeah, I mean, that's for sure. You know, they walked right in. As I said, for years was a distinct possibility. There might not even be a battle for Kabul. They just might walk right in and take over that place. And, you know, everybody ought to be uh, thankful for the ease of the transition of power here. It was inevitable anyway. So it would have been a lot worse to just have a bunch more fighting and then they still win. So, and then, you know, also, it, you know, they have a real incentive to want to play it cool now after inheriting the country, especially with such ease. Um, and they are ruthless sons of bitches a lot of times, so they could make bad calls and do vicious things. I wouldn't put it entirely past them, but I agree with you that I don't see any reason to think that they are now going to start the whole new era of their renewed rule off on the wrong foot by breaking their deal with the Americans and getting themselves carpet bombed in a situation where they just wouldn't have to do that at all. In fact, aren't they trying to show the whole world that, see, we ain't so bad and that kind of thing? That's the public relations campaign that they've settled on, at least for now, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, at the first press conference, their spokesman was, you know, saying all these things like, oh, women will be able to work and go to school. And, you know, they kind of they want international recognition. Um, so, yeah, they don't have, you know, because if you think about it, they're pretty much just took over the just about virtually the entire country, um, except for a few areas. So they don't want to have to deal with the, the Americans now. Like, you know, this is a, a new kind of era for them. Um, and there are protests popping up. So in, from their view, why antagonize the Americans and then have to worry about getting bombed when when you're kind of settling into this their, their new rule? Uh, and there's and they're, they're in talks with Karzai and Abdullah Abdullah of the old government. Uh, so that, that's kind of another signal that they're uh, ready to put aside their old beefs and stuff. Um, and there's there's like a U.N. document, apparently, that says they've been going around door to door hunting people down. But it, again, this stuff isn't confirmed. Some Something that I did see from Tolo News, which is an Afghanistan news site, uh, is that in one province, the governor and the police chief are like, we're taken and they're missing. Uh, but that's really it. I mean, maybe, you know, and that's kind of what I would expect. Maybe more just high level officials they might throw in jail or kill. They might kill some of them. But I don't think that they're going to be hunting down, you know, Afghan, every interpreter and stuff. Um, and that is uh, and they want the Afghans to stay. They they they. Uh, released uh, a statement to the imams uh, for Friday's prayers in Afghanistan to, you know, encourage unity and to encourage the Afghans that are trying to leave to stay. Um, so, again, I'm sure some people are going to get killed. It's not going to be pretty, but uh, things could be much worse. Um, so, yeah, I did see one thing where, and look, I ain't their public relations, man, but you know, truth is the truth. And I don't really know exactly what's true, but it's interesting, the dispute. Here's a picture of a bunch of Taliban madmen with machine guns harassing these guys, throwing them up against the wall. And one guy's pointing an RPG at them when it's a crowd, with, including his own men, standing right up against this wall. Like, dude, point your RPG away. What are you doing? Dumb, dumb. But anyway. Um, and then this is shown as, you know, the new totalitarianism of the Taliban or something like that. But then you look at that photo in another context and the caption is that these guys were accused of looting and stealing and the Taliban were acting as the police arresting them. And so, you know, I don't know exactly what was the truth of it, but it just goes to show how easy it is to, you know, a picture's worth a thousand words and you can make up whatever you want. <laughs> you yeah, know? yeah. No, and it's something we have to kind of be vigilant right now because, uh, again, we don't want to just take the Taliban for their word and stuff. Of but no. there's a lot of interest in, in um, making it seem a lot worse on the ground than it than it is. Um, 
there are people that want us to escalate. I mean, Lindsey Graham and his buddy Jack Keane, the general from uh, works for Kim Kagan, they wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal today, you know, saying send the troops into into Kabul, uh, put them in harm's way. <laughs> he made some comments today, Lindsey Graham, that, you know, we got to go get our Afghan allies. All of a sudden, Lindsey Graham cares about, you know, Afghans and it wants to put our the troops in harm's way and he's threatening that Biden might get impeached over it. Um, so, you know, there is a lot of push. And if you watch these, I mean, if you just, the press conference, I just watched the way the reporters are, you know, carrying on about uh, why Biden's trusting the Taliban and isn't sending troops and to get Americans out, yeah. you know, there's, there's just, there's a lot of interest behind uh, keeping us there. Yeah, of course. Well, and just, you know, for partisan reasons, just making look Biden look as stupid as possible and all that. But now, so what about this 15,000? How many Americans, how many American civilians who don't work for the embassy are spread throughout Afghanistan? And where are they all? Is it really true that there are hundreds or thousands of people left behind in Jalalabad and Kandahar City and Lashkargah and Ghazni and wherever around the country or not? I, I, I don't know. That's one thing. It's kind of tough to know. Uh, there's not really any details. on. They're all given these ballpark numbers. Apparently, the State Department, they're trying to, like, get a hard count. Um, but, yeah, where they are, um, you know, and again, these are all American citizens that were in Afghanistan, I guess, doing their own thing. I'm sure it was a lot of NGO workers and some, you know, intelligence people, maybe contractors working for the government and in their – or uh, – you know, in their own way or whatever, but, you know, and they, they chose to stick around. Uh, and I guess, you know, they're blaming the Biden administration because they didn't warn that the government would collapse this quickly, but still, I mean, uh, and to your point where they're spread out, I, I really, it's really tough to know, um, if they're just in Kabul or if they're across the country. Hey, y'all check out my new book enough already. Time to end the war on terrorism at enoughalreadybook.net. Early reviews are that people either think it's hilarious or they get so angry that they put it down. But it's the Iranian Revolution, the 80s Afghan War, the Iran-Iraq War, Iraq War I, Iraq War I and a half, and then Afghanistan, Iraq War II, Somalia, Pakistan, Libya, Syria, Iraq War III, Yemen, and all the special operations wars throughout Africa in the aftermath of the war in Libya. It's all there for you. It might change a friend's mind. Enough already. Time to end the war on terrorism at enoughalreadybook.net. Hey guys, Scott Horton here for expanddesigns.com. Harley Abbott and his crew do an outstanding job designing, building, and maintaining my sites, and they'll do great work for you. You need a new website? Go to expanddesigns.com slash scott and save 500 bucks. Hey guys, check out Listen and Think audiobooks. They're listenandthink.com and of course on audible.com and they feature my book Fool's Errand: Time to End the War in Afghanistan as well as brand new out Inside Syria by our friend Reese Ehrlich and a lot of other great books mostly by libertarians there. Uh, Reese might be one exception, but essentially they're all uh, libertarian audiobooks and here's how you can get a lifetime subscription. To listen and think audiobooks, just donate $100 to The Scott Horton Show at scotthorton.org slash donate. It's important yeah, we, to point out here that they would have had to tell the whole truth, which is almost impossible, right? That, look, the Afghan government that we built is a complete joke. Forget it. And the Afghan army that we built and police forces, they're just never going to last. And so based on that calculation... We're taking all their trucks and all their guns and all this stuff. We're not leaving behind for the Taliban to get. We're going to go ahead and destroy it all. Um, and they could never do that because, I mean, their their call was that they would just, uh, you know, leave up, leave the army there armed up and strong enough to defend itself at least for a while. And I guess they had to believe their own BS to really stick with that. And then they ended up leaving all these weapons behind for others. But they would have had to come all the way clean that this mission is a complete and total failure first. Because think about all of the smear and all the spin from 
the war party that, oh, man, you took all the last of the ANA's trucks and armored vehicles and weapons away? Well, no wonder they fell. You know what I mean? That would be the blame. And so just like they said, I guess this makes sense as an excuse. They said if they'd evacuated the embassy earlier, well, that would have also been blamed for undermining confidence in the government and forcing them to give up. And so they didn't want to send that bad signal. And I can kind of see that. Like, they are stuck between a rock and a hard place on that unless they come all the way clean and just say, look, this whole thing has already been a failure. And even if the Taliban haven't made it to Jalalabad and and, um, Ghazni and Kabul yet, we know they're coming. And so we're just going to go ahead and, and cancel even our attempt at propping up this ANA. And you can see how politically that would have been bad for them to do. And Democrats just aren't honest, honest enough people to just tell the truth and, and pursue that. But so they do look really bad for all the weapons that have fallen into the hands of the Taliban. I mean, like, for example, um, if there's going to be this kind of final assault on the Panjshir Valley, aren't they going to be driving American Humvees and firing <laughs> yeah. American rifles? As the Taliban cavalry comes to roust out the last of these warlords here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is really bad optics um, and everything looks really bad. But uh, like you said, um, you know, and when it comes to the embassy, I mean, they really did evacuate the embassy pretty quickly um, and kept, the, you know, the diplomatic staff pretty safe, I'd say. Um, so. Yeah, I mean, uh, when you talk about the weapons, that there was a report in Reuters yesterday that uh, a Biden official said that they're considering airstrikes and some of the larger equipment. But that would be the stupidest thing they could do right now because that would give the Taliban a reason to start attacking. And even saying that to Reuters, whoever that Biden official was, it's very, very uh, stupid. Um, you know, they the, the fact is they just have to focus on the evacuation and – you know, just deal with the PR stuff later. Um, but and you you mentioned the Panjshir Valley. I mean, they're, yeah, they're I was trying to say, form... tell me everything you know about that because I know it's a lot. You got a great piece about it from yesterday, right? Yeah, yeah. So um, this is like the last holdout uh, against the Taliban, really. And there's a guy named Ahmad Masood, who is the son of a kind of famous mujahideen fighter who fought against the soviet union and fought against the taliban and he was part of the northern alliance he was killed like right before 9 11 so he he wasn't involved in the u.s war there right. uh, really but and eric margulies found in the kgb records he was a double agent for the reds all along oh yeah okay. no wonder the cia liked him so much they're idiots anyway go mm-hmm. ahead yeah yeah so so his son wrote an op-ed that was published in the Washington Post, um, call, you know, calling for the U.S. to arm arm them, arm this the new Mujahideen in the Panjshir Valley. Uh, so, um, you know, if you look at a map, uh, you know, they're pretty isolated. They, like, I don't, to get a supply line into them, like, the... the how realistic it is that this will actually be some sort of resistance force. Um, I, I don't really think, you know, maybe they could hold them off out of the valley there, but they, they wouldn't be able to get spread much more than that. But also Amrullah Salah, who was the vice president for Ghani, Ashraf Ghani, who fled Afghanistan last Sunday. Apparently he's there too. And, and he's kind of joined in on this little, little resistance, but he, he spoke to the New York times and right now he's calling for like a political settlement. He just wants to be involved in the talks. Um, so, so he says, but uh, so who knows how far this is really going to go uh, or, you know, they might just make a settlement with the Taliban here. But just the fact that, you know, that was published in the Washington Post already, like as we're pulling out, it's like, oh, here's an option if you want to continue the war against the Taliban. And Well, keep- you following this guy, NatSec Jeff on Twitter? Natsec Jeff? No. Yeah, uh, he's on your list now. Um, I don't know who he is. Maybe somebody mm-hmm. does. Um, but uh, he seems to have a lot of good stuff. And he talked about how there were a bunch of elders from the Panzer Valley came to Kabul to meet with the Taliban. 
and it looked at him. Oh, okay. I'm out of date on this now, by the way. This would have been 12 hours ago or whatever last night, but um, the last time I saw it. But he was saying, yeah, it looks like there's at least a good chance that the Pancher Valley's going to surrender before a fight. Yeah. And then, and it'll be the elders who are from there who decide before they let Dostum or whoever else decide. I'm sure Dostum and and Noor and Masood and whoever have a say in it. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. Yeah. Hey, you know what, too? I thought it was further north. Then I went and saw on a map where it was marked, and it's just north of the Bagram Air Base. Yeah. So... Aren't they screwed now that the <laughs> Taliban owns the Bagram Air Base and can build up all the forces in the world that they want to there? And then, yeah, it ain't the old days, man. In the 1990s, when, you know, it was Hekmatyar versus Dostum, where neither side had just inherited $50 billion worth of trucks and arms. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, yeah. Or how I'm sure I'm underestimating 50 billion. I think it must be a lot more than that, including helicopters and not just all Blackhawks, but also, you know, Russian hind helicopters that America had India buy for them and stuff. So Hmm. they've got a powerful military now. (laughs) That's how, yeah, they they do. And uh, I wonder if we're going to support uh, Iran in the next war against the Taliban in like a year and a half from now. We'll be like, look, the Ayatollah. Is um, he really cares about women's rights and stuff? <laughs> well, that's a, another thing about the Panjshir Valley is that it, nobody really knows how many fighters they actually have. There is, the New York Times quoted some Afghan officials who said that it was between two thousand and twenty five hundred, uh, but then the other guys wouldn't say. So who knows? But if it's that small, then uh, I don't think they can really do much. But yeah. You know, and it is a really interesting aspect of the whole thing is how it's going to shake out with the U.S. Um, you know, right now they're focusing on the evacuation, but say we, we get out and the Taliban forms some government. They put Karzai and Abdul in some, you know, they give them some symbolic council or something. And then China and Russia and Tajikistan and Pakistan and Uzbek, they all just, you know, uh, Tra- trade with them and recognize them what the u.s is gonna do uh we're already freezing there the afghan government has billions uh in funds in the in the u.s that those are frozen but then again i mean those are probably just ours anyway right but uh and the imf is blocking funds to them so that that's kind of the question now is is the u.s just gonna sanction the hell out of afghanistan or are they Gonna, I mean, I feel like there's going to be a lot of heat on the Biden administration, so they might kind of keep pressure on the on a Taliban government instead of opening a trade relationship with them or something. But maybe just in a few years, we might just, you know, be friends with the Taliban government in Kabul. I mean, who knows? I mean, that's my fear is that the CIA is already going to work with them to support Uyghurs the ETIM yeah. group against China. And yeah, you know, JSOC a year ago was flying as their air force against ISIS. So they have some kind of, you know, pretty open communication on that level. And yeah. I don't know if you saw this. It's only half believable to me. The thing about Christopher Miller. Oh yeah, I did. And I don't mean Chris Miller, the greatest skateboarder who ever lived. I mean, Christopher Miller, who was the, um, Secretary of Defense for the last couple of months of uh, Trump there, where he said Trump was never going to get out on May 1st. He was just using that as a cudgel to pressure the Taliban to let us stay for counterterrorism. Like they're just going to let us keep one Bagram Air Base, something like that. So I guess I believe that they might have thought that they were going to try that. But yeah. I don't I don't think that there's any reason in the world why the Taliban would think that they need America to help them kill ISIS guys. Not mm-hmm. at this point. And they want to kill ISIS guys anyway. So. Uh, yeah. Yeah, it's tough to know with those like uh, former Trump officials, even if he, it seemed like he was kind of defending the Trump administration. Like we didn't actually plan to leave. But uh, yeah, you know, it's, 
Right. Yeah, I think that's right. It's true that they say. Yeah. But I mean, and Trump, he's been like just going after Biden. Like, uh, you know, I, I think about when Trump said he's going to pull out of Syria, how he he ultimately reversed that, even though there was some uh, of, official. I forget who it was. I think James Jeffrey. He was like the U.S. envoy to Syria. He he said that they were playing shell games to hide the real number of troops in Syria, but Trump did ultimately reverse the decision. Now imagine the media storm. I mean, they're, they've all turned on Biden over this. Imagine the media storm if tr- this was happening under Trump. Uh, you yeah. know, I, I don't know if you would be able to stand up to it. <laughs> well, you know, but, I went on Fox News and the whole narrative was Biden sucks and look at what a disaster this is. And I told them, get it straight. This is the best thing Biden's ever done in his life. Him and Trump, too. And they should all be congratulated and thank. This is just a little thing compared to ending this horrible war. Yeah. And so that, to me, is... In fact, the guy I was on with was saying, the worst thing about this is it discredits withdrawal. You make withdrawal look so bad that then they get to say, see what happens when you withdraw or whatever. And that's kind of true. But then, so what's the solution to that? We just got to push right back on that narrative and say, nope, still. Withdraw is still yeah. awesome. I don't care how bad Biden is at it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, and it this, the shame of it is that there's a bunch of Americans paying attention to Afghanistan right now that didn't probably didn't even know we were still there a few months ago. <laughs> like, uh, p- people barely t- pay attention to these wars, and then as we withdraw, it looks really hectic and chaotic. But, I mean, look at how it's been, even just the past few months, all the fighting and the violence against civilians and stuff compared to now. It's really not that that bad. And, you know, a successful, quote unquote, successful withdrawal in the eyes of the U.S. establishment would have meant that uh, Afghanistan would have just been they would have been fighting a brutal civil war for probably years to come. And that we would have been funding, giving them three billion dollars, three point three billion dollars each year to fight and kill each other. Um, Mm -hmm. So they're just mad that Afghans aren't decided not to keep killing each other <laughs> i mean all right listen it's not fair but i gotta kick you off my show right now i'm all out of time some guy's gonna interview me in a minute but listen everybody you gotta read dave all the time he's the best thing we got right now at antiwar.com so good he writes so much great stuff at news.antiwar.com him and the great jason ditz holding it all down for you keep it track of every one of these wars and the cold wars with the major powers and all of the corruption and every bit of it news.antiwar.com. Thank you so much, Dave. Thanks, Scott. Thanks for having me back. The Scott Horton Show, Antiwar Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in LA. APSradio.com, antiwar.com, scotthorton.org, and libertarianinstitute.org.